In the world of postgraduate education, somebody has to develop the classes and programs that lead to degrees. The challenge, however, is who? Who has the experience and insights into the topic and at the same time can design a structured education? How do these programs come together? What credentials does the course designer and instructor need? What does a job like this look like? In this episode of Careers That Matter, Mark Selman, PhD, the director of the Executive MBA in Aboriginal Business and Leadership at the Beatty School of Business, takes us inside his career. So you have an interesting job. <laughs> what yes. is it? How do you describe what your job <laughs> is? <laughs> well, um, I'm sort of semi-retired now, so I, my job is even more interesting um, in lots of ways. But for many years, I ran customized educational programs at the BD School of Business, mm -hmm. uh, which was absolutely wonderful because it allowed me to develop all kinds of relationships outside of the university. Um, and universities are amazing places to be around, but they're, they can be a bit stultifying. Um, and being able to work between the university and the fantastic resources that are there and outside organizations that might have specialized interests in education was just a tremendous thing for me. I, it was gave me all kinds of opportunities. So what kinds of programs were these that you were customizing? Well, um, I started probably the first really, well, I did some small things. Like we, I was hired by Simon Fraser University when they were just building the downtown campus. So almost 30 years ago now, maybe mm -hmm. 30 years ago. And there were all kinds of things that needed to be done. And um, the university at the time was primarily thinking about the campus as a way to get close to the business community downtown. But because of its location on Hastings Street, it was actually between about six or seven different communities. Mm -hmm. And so it was a fascinating time. So I um, was fortunate. I developed relationships with the downtown east side, especially with um, Ken Leotier, mm -hmm. uh, because he was just involved in starting United We Can, the recycling depot for, yes. uh, that was run by and invented by uh, people who collected bottles and cans out of dumpsters. And um, I just, I saw there was an opportunity to connect the university to other communities mm -hmm. besides the business community. The business and community is important to me, and I was hired, I think, partly because I, I had run my own businesses and I had experience in that world. Um, Both as a business owner and a business consultant, correct? Primarily as a business owner at okay. that stage. I had been in the construction and manufacturing businesses. Um, and then, uh, but then this gave me an opportunity to link my interests and professional qualifications in the area of education uh, with communities that mm -hmm. I cared about. And so that was probably very early on, I developed this program with United We Can. Um, you know, they wanted to have a board. None of the people who were available to be on the board had any kind of knowledge about governance of uh, boards of nonprofits. So we helped them learn about that mm -hmm. uh, and a variety of other things. So that was one foray. Uh, we developed lecture series, um, you know, kind of ordinary university stuff on the one hand. But then I uh, got an opportunity to, well, there was a guy from Canadian Pacific Railway. Yeah. His name was Joe Bracken, probably is Joe Bracken, uh, yeah. although I haven't talked to him for years. He came to me and he said, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year uh, in our Western Canada office, which was then in Vancouver, um, on training for our people. And they take more and more about whatever they're good at. So if they are computer network administrators, they go to workshops on computer networks. And if they organize trains and rail yards, they go to conferences where they focus on that. And everything takes, makes people more and more specialized, and nothing brings them together. And we know that our business is changing. Mm -hmm. It's going to change very rapidly over the next while. And people have to be able to move around the organization if they're going to stay. Mm 
And he said, we have lots of people who have specialized knowledge, but no general education. And that that's holding them back in their careers. They can't advance and they can't transfer into another area of our business. So we want to have a way for people to get a, a recognition, educational recognition and knowledge that's more general than they would normally take and that is completely portable because we know that not all these people are going to be able to stay at CP and they need to be have this recognized wherever they go. So he and I, well, I told him no. <laughs> I told him no. There was Who no wants way to start. Yeah, there was no way we uh, we could do that at SFU. We we could not develop a degree program, which I assume that's what he really wanted was a degree program that would accept people with all different mishmash of educational credentials mm -hmm. and give them credit for what they had studied, even if it wasn't academic, um, and then you know take them through in a timely manner to a degree. And I said, you know, go to the Open Learning Agency or somebody like that. So that was the end of the conversation. He, two weeks later, he showed up again and said, I've thought about that. That's not what we want. We want a degree from an established university um, that has its own standards that, you know, that is carry some weight with it. Yeah. And we don't want to go to the Open Learning Agency um, or some place like that. Uh, and I think you should be able to do this. So I said, okay, well, I'll ask a few people. And I went to the Dean of Arts at the time and said, I have this inquiry. I know it's not what we normally do, mm -hmm. but it kind of fits with what we say we would like to be able to do. And it definitely fits with the idea of having a downtown campus that we would actually respond to what people downtown are saying they need, uh, as opposed to telling them what we've designed for them that they could come and take. And so, uh, and he said, that's fantastic. He said, that's wonderful. We have a budget freeze. We have a tuition freeze. We can't develop any new programs in the university. Our hands are tied around everything. If you and I are smart about this, we'll figure out a way to develop that program and develop it in a way that can get around all these hurdles to new program development. And uh, so we worked together, and we worked with CP Rail and eventually we worked with BC Hydro because CP Rail moved its head office in the middle of the time we were working with them and so they didn't have as many people here locally. So we convinced uh, one of the vice presidents at BC Hydro who happened to be a student in a graduate program that we both taught in um, that this would be a good idea and we put together a, a cohort of students and we gave them th two years of university education in a three, over a three-year period and it was a mixture of management and liberal arts and it was very successful. Did that wind up giving you a template to produce or generate new other new programs? Yes, uh, all sorts of in all sorts of little ways but we we basically developed the idea of customized programs. Uh, there's a lot of technical details I'd have to go into about how you can get approval for things within universities, but we basically exploited loopholes in the way that the university structures these things. Uh, and there, there was a provision for an individual student to be able to undertake a specialized program of study if they had if they wanted to design something for themselves, if they could get an academic committee together and so on. And we just said, oh, well, if you can do that for one person, why can't you do it for 30 people? And so we ended up developing this customized program. Uh, and it was very successful when we were working with corporations. And then it, I ended up um, having another opportunity. I moved somewhere else in the university. and when the Dean of Arts was no longer the Dean, it just, uh, the program was not continued with the same, at the same level and with the same mm -hmm. verve that we had undertaken it. It did last for 10 years and it yeah. made a big difference. So anyway, that was, that was one thing. We developed the idea of uh, programs where students don't pay tuition because it was paid for entirely by their company. Yeah. So we had contracts with the company, which we, established that pattern because we wanted to get around the tuition freeze that was in place provincially. Um, 
and that was successful, and we've used it with other programs since. And so are you, are you a department head or are you a professor? Like, what exactly is your role? Because it sounds yeah. like you need to understand not only the curriculum, the development of the curriculum, the delivery, but also how to navigate your way through the labyrinth of yeah. uh, rules and regulations within a university environment. Right. Well, I uh, th- throughout most of my career at the university, I escaped categorization. I mean, I was in a in a unit of employees, but it was not as a faculty member. I was a faculty member for a few years on a part-time basis while I had another appointment. Uh, that, frankly, they didn't know what to do with me exactly, and that no, there were big red lines around my position when, uh, that nobody would ever, no one ever again would be appointed into an appointment like this with the mix of things that I did, which crossed over between having academic authority over programs and and being an administrator, mm-hmm. and that the university doesn't really have that. Uh, so when I was first there, I thought, oh, I should be a faculty member, right? I've got a PhD. There's no reason why I shouldn't be a faculty member. I should have tenure like all the other people I'm working with. And then after a while, I realized I didn't want that at all. I, I loved my role of being able to move around. I moved from continuing studies to the faculty of business. I kept doing the same kind of work. Um, and the position was kind of immaterial because I had developed a bit of a reputation for being able to do these things that other people in the university didn't do. And uh, the, I moved over to business because because Cominco, the smelting company, wanted to have graduate courses for their engineers because they had downsized so much that their engineers were being thrust into management positions without knowing anything about management. And they used to just absorb it because of their, uh, because of being in the business for a while. Mm-hmm. But now they were finding that they weren't absorbing it fast enough because they didn't have the mentorship available and everything was rushed in terms of these transitions. And so they you know, were ending up with managers who didn't understand about corporate law or about finance or about um, environmental issues because they were, their business was changing. They had to be freshly aware of environmental issues, and now Indigenous relations would also fall on that list. Um, so uh, the faculty of business didn't know how to do that. Right? That's not how universities work. They sit back, they advertise their programs, people come, they sign up as individuals, and said, how can we put on a program for, for 30 managers of a company for credit? They want it for credit, and you know, we just don't have a way of doing that. So, but that was the kind of stuff I did. So, would it be safe to call you an education innovator? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think so. Our our, uh, our MBA uh, in Indigenous Business and Leadership was on the list of uh, of most innovative things done in BC. That the you know, like a business award for that. Um, so, we were in the top twenty innovations in BC that year. I think we were tenth, maybe in the. So, so yes, I, yeah. uh, I would be ha- proud to be recognized as an educational innovator. So, you know, they would draw this red circle around your name and go, nobody's ever going to be allowed to do this again. But somebody might be watching this going, well, I don't know, Mark, I want to be like you. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would be an essential element in my own development that would put me in a position, should it arise, to possibly seize upon what, uh, something similar to what you're doing. What, what do you think is like, like key to being able to succeed in what you're doing? Yeah, well, it's a very, very good question, one that I've puzzled about quite a bit because I have had lots of people come to me and say, oh, I want a job like yours. And I say, <laughs> well, they don't really have jobs like mine. You have to, you have to create it. You, right. know, you have to make it. So, uh, well... It helps a lot. In a university, having a PhD is a huge advantage. I think yes. if I hadn't had a PhD, I couldn't have um, finagled all the things I you finagled. Wouldn't have had the credibility. I wouldn't have had the credibility. Yeah. Um, but universities respond very much to relatively small amounts of external um, money and other forms of motivation. Uh, so if you can create 
meaningful links, mm -hmm. whether it's in the downtown east side and that makes the university eligible for provincial government funding that it might otherwise not get access to, or whether it's working with a business where they can write a contract to have a bunch of managers educated. Right. Uh, that kind of stuff has a high currency value, not with faculty members in the university, but with the administration of the university. Yeah. Um, and then you need to have some luck with contacts. Like I had this, fortunately I developed this great relationship with the Dean of Arts, which is a very important position at SFU. The Dean of Arts is, you know, one of the, the it's probably half the university reports to the Dean of Arts. So, yeah. uh, so I was just lucky to find somebody who shared some of my interests and values yeah. around this. And of course, you can hope for administrators like Andrew Patter. Um, Andrew, well, as the president, you don't really get involved in programming or anything like that, but his, he set an example and he set an image as an engaged university that made the kind of work that I was doing uh, actually fit what the university said it wanted to do, yep. which it hadn't really previously until that point. And I was also lucky early in my career, Jack Blaney, who eventually became president of the mm -hmm. university, was the, was influential. Obviously, he had um, built the downtown campus, basically. Yeah. And, um, and he had respect for me as a programmer. He always used to use the word programmer. Uh, that uh, I was someone who knew how to design an educational program, which, you know, was partly because of my education, um, yeah. uh, but was also just from I had been an entrepreneur. I knew how to do stuff, right? How to get things done, how to win people over when you needed to, and how to line up the resources and plan and stuff like that. That you can't really get taught anywhere. Um, you have to. Yeah. You have to learn it. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Great. Well, okay. a pleasure to talk to you. I, I could talk to you all day, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Thank you very much.